Um, that's in March. Uh, the war began in September when the Germans invaded Poland. Uh, I don't remember that. I mean, I was told because I was a baby then. Uh, and I was raised. Uh, but in 1948, the Communist Party, uh, which was an arm of the Soviet Union, actually, uh, took over uh, Hungarian politics, essentially. They defeated the small business um, party, uh, and uh, they literally beat up the candidates of the opposition to prevent them from uh, being victorious. And uh, that's how Hungary became a puppet regime of the Soviet Union. There were all kinds of puppet regimes in Bulgaria, Romania, uh, the Czech, Czechoslovakia at the time it was called. And Hungary was just one of the other satellite countries. And all of education got taken over by the Hungarian Marxists. And so we were basically taught out of textbooks written by Marxists. Um, even in colleges, universities in Budapest, there was a one-party line education. That's the only way you could get through um, your high school, your college, your graduate school, is by towing the Marxist line. And um, I was beginning to get annoyed by this. Uh, it was, I don't really know how I became rebellious. One reason was that my uh, parents were normal Central European bourgeoisie. They had jobs, professions. They didn't have property, but nonetheless, um, they were also identified with the Germans because my mother's name was a German name and that put them in opposition of the ruling party because the Germans were generally dismissed as Nazis. Um, this is almost too much to convey because although um, it's kind of interesting but it's not really germane to what we're here about. There's one little episode. We were given a talk by a, a big woman who was teaching us what was translated as constitutional law. But in the course of the one of the lectures, she was explaining the famous Marxist motto that from each according to his ability to each according to his name. And I spoke up when this um, idea was conveyed to us. And I asked him, well, suppose I start off the day with like five dollars or four ends. And my friend and I both have five four ends. And he goes out and buys himself some wood and builds a table. And I go out and buy myself a bottle of wine. And I drink myself under that table. I almost literally said that. Now, he manages to rake in a few extra bucks because he built this table. So I ask whether he has to share this with me. Is he obligated to share it with me even though I squandered my wealth and he capitalized on it. Well, the class was brought to a screeching halt. My mother was called in, <laughs> and I was sent off to technical high school. And 
the reasoning was that I was not qualified because my mentality was too bourgeoisie. So I, sh I should stick to working with my hands, not with my mind. Now, I was just an innocent kid. I didn't do this as a big act of rebellion. I just It just made no sense to me that he would have to share his stuff with, uh, I, that he would have to share his income with me when I was such a louse. But of course, everything is moved by forces that are impersonal under Marxism. So the idea that I deserve something or that he deserves something made no sense within those terms. Um, anyway, that was my first act of rebellion. After that, I became uh, a bit notorious about my opposition to the regime. I used to run by the uh, Soviet embassy and swear at the guards. Uh, you know, just out of spite, just for the fun of it. And uh, my mother realized that I was running into harm's way, that in time I would probably be shot. So even though he was divorced, she was divorced from my father who was living in Germany, he actually worked for Radio Free Europe, which was like the Voice of America, a kind of a CIA outpost in Munich, Germany. And uh, so my mother and he, despite their differences, and in fact their um, rather very angry stance toward one another, they decided to rescue me and they hired a professional smuggler, someone who later on was labeled by Time Magazine a flesh peddler because he helped people get out to the West. And this guy showed up on October 14, 1953, at our apartment with a few letters that I had written to my father to authenticate himself, to demonstrate that he was really someone who was trying to help me rather than trap me. And my mother gave me one day to decide whether I wanted to join this smuggler on the way out of Hungary. And uh, um, next day, we told him yes. I said, what the hell? Of course I want to go west. Uh, and my mother and I didn't even cry when we said goodbye. We just sort of said, well, under these circumstances, the best thing for me to do is to follow the flesh peddler. And uh, this was an interesting journey. It was almost like one of those old black and white movies from Hollywood with Dana Andrews and Ingrid whatever, Stevens and uh, a bunch of others who would star in these movies which were sort of anti-communist movies. Remember when it was okay to do anti-communist movies in Hollywood? Uh, we traveled to a town called Kyr, which is about 30 kilometers from the Austro-Hungarian border. We got off the bus. I went by bus, and then there were four adults who came by train. We got off in Jür, picked up bicycles which we had mailed to the railroad station, and got on the top of those bicycles. Well, first we had dinner at a restaurant, and then we got on the top of these bicycles and started to head toward the Austro-Hungarian border. A place called Nikolsdorf. Oddly enough, in 1989, when the Iron Curtain came down, that was the place where it came down, Nikolsdorf. Uh, the Hungarians opened the border to Germans who came down from uh, East Germany to let them come out and go over to West Germany. 
was at this little town, Nicholsdorf. And I remember that because I was subscribing to the New York Times and the front page said, Nicholsdorf is where all these refugees were coming out. Um, what was it about that town? That it was just close to the border, that's all. It was just a, it was an Austrian town close to the uh, border, which by the way, at that time, and I didn't know that, that every, every border is a no man's land. Between the Austrian border and the Hungarian border, there's a little like a, a 10 yard uh, easement or something where um, it's neither Austria nor Hungary, it's a no man's land. But this was booby trapped. So our uh, smuggler had to be very careful that we don't trip the wires of the booby trap because that would have blown us all up. So he kind of carved out an area to go. By the way, to get to this spot was arduous because uh, the, the walk from Dieu to this, this 30 kilometer walk in the middle of the night, we had to stay in haystacks during the day because we wanted to not be no, not be spotted by border guards. So we slept in these haystacks, which was not exactly comfortable. Um, but anyway, we got to the border. He led us across. Now, when we finally crossed into Austria, I remember this, this was something that stuck to my mind, that the adults who were with us, four adults, uh, all of them from the Hungarian national motion picture industry, they were escaping with the treasury. They were bringing a bunch of Hungarian money with them, and hoping that they would, you know, turn it into Austrian money or German money or something. I don't really know how it ended up because I lost track of those people as soon as we crossed. But when we crossed the border, these adults suddenly decided not to go anywhere. They wanted to sleep. But the smuggler knew that we were 10 miles from Nikolsdorf, where we were supposed to catch a train into Vienna. And so I was the only one he could um, enlist to push these adults, I mean physically push them in the direction of the train station. Because they, they were so damn tired that they thought that once we got across the border, who the hell cares about anything, we just go to sleep. But there was still things to be, and moreover, when we got to the Nikolstorf train station and we boarded the train, train was full of Russian Soviet soldiers. Because at the time, Austria was still partitioned. It was a French section, it was an American section, and it was a Soviet section, like in Berlin. And uh, however, I spoke German by that time because my mother brought me on to, uh, up to speak German. And my smuggler and I, walked through the ranks of the Soviet soldiers speaking loudly in German in order to mislead them to think that we were just ordinary Austrian citizens. And they bought it. So they never bothered us. So in the middle of the Soviet uh, military personnel, we essentially escaped from communism. And we ended up in the Westbahnhof in Vienna, the West uh, Railway Station, and boarded the train to Linz, Austria. In Linz, we disembarked and were picked up by the American Counter Espionage Organization. They were located in Linz. For about a week, they debriefed us. They asked every one of us what we knew about the Soviets, uh, 
uh, about communism, about, you know, everything. Now, I was too young to really remember the questions they asked. All I knew was that they gave us cigarettes and chocolates. There's really cool chocolates, you know. Those, those old-fashioned chocolates that kind of got white in the middle and green. Anyway, um, after a week, my father drove down from Munich to Linz and picked me up. But we were not yet home free. I had to be smuggled into Germany because I had no papers. And while the Austrians would welcome us as escapees from Hungary, the Germans were not as kind at the time. They would just look upon us as illegal aliens. Well, as an illegal alien, I was taken by my father in his Mercedes, in the back seat, covered with a blanket across the Austro, the Austrian-German um, border, and driven to Munich. I lived in Munich for three years after that, went to German school, and then eventually I went to uh, the American high school at the Southern uh, American headquarters. Uh, it was a famous region of military, uh, of American military, uh, the occupied forces were there. Oh, they were not. See, the difference, it's always kept in mind, in the Soviet region, the Soviets were really brutal occupiers. In the American regions, the Americans were always sort of soft occupiers. They, they uh, occupied with the kid, kid gloves. Um, so I lived in, in Munich for three years, after which we um, boarded a ship, an American ship, in Bremerhaven, Germany, up in the northern, northwestern corner of, of Germany, of what then was called West Germany, and took nine days to traverse the Atlantic Ocean and land in New York Harbor. And in New York Harbor, we arrived at one o'clock in the morning, and one of the biggest impressions that I have of that arrival is that it was so damn busy. The cars were driving all over the east, all over Manhattan, around the place. I've never seen that much traffic in the middle of the night. Europe was like a small city compared to New York. New York is like this humongous, bustling, Metropolis. Um, the next day we were picked up by a bus and driven to Cleveland. Cleveland, Ohio at the time was the second largest Hungarian city in the world next to Budapest. Because there were almost all the refugees who escaped from Hungary ultimately went to uh, the Buckeye district of Cleveland. And so did I. And uh, I ended up there, but in six months, my father was a brutal Nazi. So it wasn't a pleasant, um, I, I, I hated him, he hated me because I didn't ever want to become a rowing champion, which he wanted me to be. He, he, he missed the Olympics during the war years. And when he brought me out of Hungary, he thought he would make me into himself, that I would carry on the torch to the Olympics. And I said, screw that, I don't like to row, it's too hard. It, I, I'm, a, I'm a lazy bastard, so. Uh, so we were always at odds. He would take me out on, the, on, a, on a lake near Munich and make me row, and I would sit there and, and uh, was morose, objectionable, and he hated me. He even took me to a doctor to examine whether my blood was like his, or was I actually conceived from a different man. <laughs> no, literally, this is, this is the, yeah. I mean, he, he showed me so much love that he suspected that, that I was 
from a different father than he. You know, that's life is. So I not only experienced communist brutality and tyranny, but also the tyranny of a essentially fascist father. Uh, one of the reasons that my father went to Germany eventually is that after the war, after the Second World War, that the Soviets wanted to uh, convict him. But there were too many people in jail, so they had to let some out. And he was one of the ones who they let out. So while he was waiting for a trial, allegedly waiting, he arranged that he would go to Austria. And he, is in, he and his second wife indeed emigrated to Austria. And I was left with my mother. These are just little extra bits and pieces of totally useless information to you. But hey, it's my life that you wanted to hear about. <laughs> so there it is. Uh, he was a notoriously famous and competent crew um, um, coach. He coached crews, I mean, rowing. He himself was a famous rower. He was a pair oars without um, cocks, and that means just two men rowing, each with one. Uh, that's right. And uh, he was so famous that the Germans offered him jobs and then eventually ended up in Denmark. And he became the coach of the Odensee Rowing Club. And then he went to work for Radio for Europe in Munich. And that's where he lived when he come, came and fetched me in Linz, Austria. So we lived in Germany. For a while, I went to German high schools, the Ludwig uh, Strasse uh, Gymnasium in Germany, in Munich. But in time, because oddly enough, because he was in Denmark and became a Danish citizen, and Denmark was not with the Axis not with the Germans in the war. Denmark was one of these countries that was sort of with the Allies. Now, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure about all this, but he had what's called PX privileges. In other words, he could, he could go shopping in the American stores in all over Europe. And one of the privileges was that he could send his children to American high school. And he did that with me. He was already having his eye on moving to America. And one of the ways to prepare for that is to have your children speak English. So I went to this American high school. And I learned smatterings of English, not perfectly, but enough to uh, be a good beginning. So in 1956, we drove up to uh, Bremerhofer, which is, as I say, the northwest corner of Germany, and we boarded the General Langfit, which was a huge mother of a, of a, of a boat. I'm sorry, what? Like a troop ship or something? General it was something, it, just, yeah, yeah. it was just a battleship, actually. Right, right. But it was enough for all of these refugees to board them. Now, at that time, the American Congress enacted a law that everybody who escaped from a communist country after a certain time, like in 52 or something, would get a free trip to the United States. They were so anti-communist that they would reward those of us who showed anti-communist predilections with a trip to the Americas. As so long as we had a job here, my father could land a job as a draftsman in Cleveland. And so we got a free ride on this. I was a, basically, what I did on that ship is wash dishes. The entire nine days, I was washing dishes. Of which I experienced another thing. We were praying for heavy seas because then everybody would get sick and nobody would want to eat. 
and we wouldn't have that many dishes to do. Yeah. This is little thing, little bits and pieces yeah. that you remember, you know. So we landed in Cleveland, uh, settled in there, but for a while I went to Philadelphia and lived with some friends whom I knew from the American high school. And uh, that's when I started to do things that are sort of like still part of my life. When I went to uh, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I went to a, an army depot. A depot is one that supplies all the goods and services throughout the uh, military. And uh, I lived there with some friends and went to their school. And they introduced me to their teachers. And the teachers featured me as a speaker in their classes and asked me to talk about things I knew nothing about. Like, who's Tito? Now, Tito was, you know, Yugoslavia's communist leader, but he was something of an independent leader. And he was an interesting subject matter to discuss. How did he get away with not towing the line for Stalin? Well, they asked me questions like that. And I found that to be kind of conducive to my personality, to be standing in front of a class. The girls loved it. In fact, I had a few nice little brushes with short romance in those cases because people would send up pieces of paper. These girls would send up pieces of paper to me. Just meet me after class, which I loved. You know, it was great. I mean, in Hungary, we always looked upon ourselves as a peculiarly romantic species. You know? Hungarian dancing and Hungarian music and Hungarian art. It's all very robust. And uh, so I sort of saw myself as somebody who could, who was a little bit of a ladies' man even back then. It stayed with me for all my life, actually. <laughs> 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 but, but, but more important was that I began to um, be a public speaker at the New Cumberland High School, which was uh, right next to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, I would give some talks about communism, about uh, uh, the communist leaders, about how you could uh, live under such a system by disguising your um, contrarian viewpoints, and so on. And so, as you can see, it's, it's sort of gravitating in the direction where I ended up being essentially a uh, libertarian, objectivist libertarian. So anyway, from Harrisburg, I went back to Cleveland. And on my 18th birthday, on March 18, 1957, I ran away from home. I had kind of courted a young lady, a Hungarian, young lady named Yeldiko Poloni, who died this two years ago. Uh, she became my sweetheart. Uh, really nutty romance. It's crazy because I was only 18 and she was 16 and a half or something. We got 